the Contemporaries Director. Thank you all for attending this evening's panel discussion, which forms part of New Contemporaries Archives and Identities Symposium, which is programmed to coincide with the New Contemporaries exhibition at South London Gallery, which we, open, which we hope to open to the public once current restrictions are lifted. Live captions are avail available by clicking the red live button in the top left of the screen and the captions will open in a new window. This evening's discussions will explore the use of archives in contemporary visual arts practice, particularly the construction and exploration of identities. It will reflect on specific methodologies of how practitioners have used both personal and public archives to consider their own positions in relation to investigating specific archive, archival material. This symposium forms part of our Bridget Riley Artist Professional Development Programme, which is supported by the Bridget Riley Art Foundation, so a huge thank you to them. I also want to say thank you to South London Gallery and Camberwell College of Art for partnering with us, and my colleague Seamus McCormack, who has programmed the, support, the symposium, supported by Sophie Bounds, Lily Tung and Reet Timmerman. As part of the symposium, we'll be hosting two workshops this week by Jocelyn Carr and Sunil Gupta. These work workshops are booked out, but there is a waiting list. 2020 New Contemporaries Artist Ufuma Essay will be contributing a response to the, to the panel discussion tonight, which will be available on our website for for a few weeks, and we're screening a work by New Contemporaries alumni Kobe Addy, Rumours and Riots, on our website until 21st March. We are delighted that this evening's discussion includes presentations by artist Duncan Campbell, who has exhibited internationally and won the Turner Prize in 2014, Althea Greenan, curator of special collections and archives at Goldsmiths, artist curator and new contemporaries alumni Sunil Gupta. The panel is chaired by Joe Melvin, reader in archives and special collections at Chelsea College of Art. We'll be taking questions from the virtual audience through the Q&A function. I really hope that you enjoy this evening's event and I thank Joe and the rest of, of the panel before I hand over to her. So thank you, Joe. Thank you very much, Kirsty. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, while I do my introduction, I'm just going to um, I'm just going to show something quickly. Um, now, is it? Can I ask you? Is it? Is it visible? Yes. It is. Yeah. 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 Fine. Okay. And it's, so, and uh, it's moving. Yeah. Yeah. So this this is this is simply to have something in the background that is of interest. I hope um, while while I'm introducing this uh, discussion around identity strategies and how we handle the archive. What what is the material of the archive and what are the questions that the archive provokes us with? Indeed, what is the context of the archive itself? Personal, private, anecdotal, found. Is it institutional? Where where is it seated? This that you see in the background is a very recently public, published book of the writings and, co and collected interviews of Seth Sieglau, uh, American curator, uh, entrepreneur, and collector, bibliophile, multi-hatted um, person who operated strategically in a number of sections of the art world. The decision-making processes of this project were something that I think resonate as, deci as decisions that we all face when we're handling the archive. And they, they involve include what to include, what to exclude. And with this particular project, which represents Sieglau's different particular interests and the specificity of those interests from the, from the, the notes, the initial notes to the publications themselves, um, and then, then ob obviously his archive contains a lot of visual material. And the decision that we made was not to include photography and to allow the reader, viewer, the immersed person who could, be, who could consider the publication as an exhibition so that it would be like a form of exhibition that takes off in all kinds of other directions. 
So what I would, what I know that we're going to be talking about in different ways by these different approaches that each of us have taken are what are our responsibilities and what are our points of access, our access for our own decision making process, where do we get the material from, uh, and the access for its audience, where is that coming from and how are we, how are we scoping that that, that mode of communication through the materiality of the archive itself. Um, we've spoken a, a little bit or a, a, allusion, alluded to the kind of aesthetic decisions of inclusion or exclusion. What are those reasons motivated by and, and to what extent do they take governance or not, as the case may be? I mean, these are questions that are afloat, I think, in all practices that are uh, involved with the kind of immersive archive. Uh, the ethical question is a question that I know uh, all the panels, or all of us on the, on the panel are very uh, engaged with in different forms and the way that manifests itself differently is particularly of note and something that we can grapple with later. Um, I think that's sufficient as a as a um, introduction to the kind of tropes, if you like, themes uh, that I'd like to uh, draw out and, and draw attention to. Um, so I think it, without more ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Duncan and stop screen sharing uh, and uh, and over to you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Joel. Um, so is that me on there? Yeah, yeah, you're on now. You're you're okay. our first speaker tonight. Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So I'm Duncan Campbell. Um, uh, I'm currently based in Glasgow. Um, so I wanted to just say at the from the get go that um, I'm no authority on archives. So what I'm um, what I'm going to say is based on my own limited experience of using them. So I've no training in, you, in accessing archives or any kind of formalized um, approach to research for that matter. Uh, so I'd like to mainly talk about a film that I made in 2008 called Bernadette, which is about Bernadette Devlin or McCallisky as she is now. Um, in terms of moving image archives and moving image archives are the, the ones that really came to the fore in this film for reasons that I'll explain later. Um, this is the film that I really felt like I cut my teeth on. Um, so just so you have a picture of who I'm talking about, um, I'm going to show a, a quick clip, uh, about a two minute clip, um, an extract from the film. Um, so can we uh, can we play the clip now? Would you like to help this train now? Well, then one of my colleagues, Hugh Delaghi, came down, and within a minute he was involved in a fracas with a Conservative MP. Situation looked pretty awful, and uh, I then got up and I got hold of Devlin Bernadette, and um, she, I must say, in all honesty, listened to me, thank God, and I was able to literally drag her out the house. And um, so far as I was concerned, she came. And then as I got her beyond the bar of the house and outside the door, one of my lady members, Lena Jager, took her off my hands. She came back about five minutes after. The whole, the whole thing was very un, un, unpleasant in the sense that uh, it was a bitter atmosphere. I wish the speaker had called her because she obviously wanted to, to say a great deal about it. Thank you very much. The British Home Secretary got up and made what he called a statement. It did not have one substantiated fact in it. It lasted three minutes, and at no stage did he even say, I regret the fact that 13 people are dead. So this was an emotional reaction of your own? It wasn't an emotional reaction. It was quite coldly and calmly done. I was the only member of parliament who was in the chamber, who was in Derry yesterday. I was fired on by the paratroopers, and yet parliamentary democracy was such but I was not allowed to speak. But what, what do you, you think, think you would achieve by that action of yours this afternoon? What I achieved was 
simply delivering to the Home Secretary a simple proletarian protest, the fact that he was responsible for the murder of 13 people. And as far as I'm concerned, that was simply a token effort. They didn't Do you feel any share of responsibility in what happened yesterday, Mr. No, we had 20,000 people marching on our streets. The streets belong to us. We have a right to be there. We had 3,000 soldiers with no right to be there, enforcing by brutality and force of arms a law which a Prime Minister who has no mandate to govern any longer and no right to make that law made, and but they shot the 13 of the in Northern Ireland. It is not, it is the law of Brian Faulkner. Do you intend to apologise to Mr Maudling? I'm Mr. just sorry I didn't get him by the throat. Well said. So, um, Bernadette Devlin, at the time uh, that this footage was shot, was a, an independent MP for the Mid-Ulster uh, seat that she occupied for a term and a half before giving it up. Uh, the interview took place after she punched the Home Secretary, Reginald Maudling, in the face on the floor of the British Parliament. Um, before she, be, well, she was an MP, she was a member of People's Democracy, a group that came out of Queen's University in Belfast. Um, uh, she became an MP and then stood down kind of out of total frustration uh, and committed herself after that to um, more kind of extra parliamentary organizing and protest. Um, very broadly, the movement that she was part of um, tried to organize around the interests of working class rather than um, along the lines of, um, along the traditional sectarian lines. Um, she was involved briefly with the Irish Republican Socialist Party. Um, she was on a committee to support the hunger strikes uh, in the early 80s. Um, she was involved in various extradition campaigns um, in the case of our daughter Roisin an attempt to extradite her to stand trial in Germany. Um, and she now works with an organization that av advocates for agricultural migrant workers in her area called STEP, which stands for the South Tyrone Empowerment Project. Um, I decided that I wanted to make the film after watching an interview that I saw of her um, on a on a youth TV program from the from the eighties, I saw the I saw the interview by chance. Um, it was in an a part of an archive that I was um, doing some research research in for another film. Um, and I I knew who she was, or at least I thought I did. But the interview was a was a real shock to me. Um, you know, in relation to the current political dispensation in Northern Ireland that in the interest of putting an end to conflict that sectarian politics have, are kind of enshrined forever in that dispensation. Um, and watching her, I think watching her speak in that, in that interview, um, it kind of gave me a glimpse of um, how things could have been different. Um, it took me about three and a half years to raise the money to, first of all, to access the material um, in the Moving Image ar Archives. Um, so during that period, I'd done a lot of um, other research, so reading and uh, conducting interviews. There was um, a special collection at the Linen Hall Library in Belfast, which is also very useful in that process. Um, but the thing was that by the time I actually got access to the material in the moving image archives, um, I couldn't um, I couldn't find the picture that I'd built up or the understanding that I'd built up from the other research. It wasn't reflected in the archives. Um, and that left me with a choice to either try and stretch what I'd found to fit the um, the understanding that I'd built up, or to take the archives with all the gaps and lapses and 
uh, misrepresentations on its own terms, which was ultimately what I decided to do. Um, I mean, it sounds like an obvious thing to say that the footage is mediated, but um, I'd like to mention a few specific examples of that in relation to representations of Bernadette Devlin. Um, so the first one that's mediated by a kind of silence um, with the television coverage of the events that she was part of, there's always a, a total failure to put that into any kind of context. Um, you know, even a relative, a relatively short sweep of history since partition. So they admit, so the reporting it omits the history of segregation and discrimination of gerrymandered political districts of a police force and paramil paramilitary reserve force operating under the Special Power Act, Powers Act, which meant entry without warrant, detention for any unlimited period, and internment without trial, or less formally as happened to Bernadette Devlin's father, uh, that he had to work away in England because someone without any due process or without him being party to that process had designated him as political, politically suspect, which meant that he couldn't work in the North. Um, by and large, the media were drawn to the violence and framed that violence as some sort of sectarian bloodletting without explaining that even if you accepted that as the case, why there weren't similar outbra out outbreaks in the rest of Britain, Britain or in the Republic of Ireland for that matter. Um, the journalists that gave her a better reception tended to lump her in with the radical chic at the time. Um, and even if you look at some of the more thoughtful or scholarly writing on her, uh, it's still difficult to reconcile what she was, someone who at one point seemed to carry a genuine mandate for a popular revolution with what she became someone with the same limitations and ability to affect the situation as anybody else. Uh, it's almost as if like such an ideal narrative requires a metaphorical death. And that perception was compounded after loyalist paramilitaries uh, tried to assassinate her. After that, there's a common perception that she was actually dead. And then as Joe mentioned in the, in, in your introduction, uh, their aesthetic considerations, you know, the fact that this whole thing's reframed by me uh, at every stage is full of my decisions and preferences, um, especially when it comes to the editing, things were um, put in or left out for no better reason than they felt right somehow. Um, I think it's usually the case, and in my experience anyway, that the present wants something from the past, but sometimes an image from the past takes you by surprise. And what I described earlier on about the uh, seeing that interview with Bernadette Michalski was a moment like that for me. Um, and for me, that's the power of archives. When something flashes up that made me feel any, anyway, how, different, how differently things could have turned out in the present. Um, but ultimately that reality, uh, the reality that Bernadette McAlisky and others fought for never materialized. So when you go looking for her in the archives, the moving image archive in particular, you don't find her. At the best you get are glimpses. As well as everything that happened at the time, power was also exercised in how it was reported deliberately or subconsciously and that process of representation or misrepresentation contributed to the process of her becoming obscured over time. And it's still there calcified in all the material in the archives. Um, so as well as anything else, I've tried to present that for what it is in the film. So that's about all I've got. Thank you very much indeed, Duncan. That was um, that was very 
thought inducing and important uh it was also it was really wonderful actually to see that footage you know after such a sort of time lapse you know not only the time lapse and the sort of lapses between what's there and not there but our own individual time lapses you know re re engaging with something from that moment thank you so if we could move uh on if um althea if you could make your presentation now uh that would be fantastic so okay. you have the screen share yep excellent to, uh, sorry it seems like i have to set it up again um oh Is that looking good? Yeah, yeah, that's great. pretty good. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks. All right, this is going to be a complete change of space. That was just mesmerizing, Duncan. But um, I, uh, I'm a sort of a nuts and bolts uh, facilitator of the archives at, at Goldsmiths. And I look after um, the Women's Art Library collection. That's how I landed there. I'm not, I'm, I wasn't trained as an archivist or a librarian or a curator for that matter. I'm just somebody who kind of knew where the stuff was and knew the history of the material and really uh, uh, was attached to this particular collection because of it was a uh, artist-led sort of activist uh, project uh, that dated from the late 70s. So what I'm gonna do now is to, is to show you the slide I want to end up in. I want to end up back in the street here. This is a uh, Lori Grove, and this is a projection from the uh, maintenance yard across the street to number 16 Lori Grove. And uh, it is a, a, a projection of Lauren Craig's Women of Color Index slideshow uh, on the occasion of her uh, the launch of a book that, uh, uh, that was produced by a, uh, artistic research group called X Marks the Spot. And Lauren was one of the uh, sort of researchers, but uh, I'm going to sort of take you through uh, this, the, uh, the slide collection and issues around digitization and different approaches to how you make an archive, like uh, the, uh, something that became an archive because of uh, technology moving on um, to uh, through different art projects to this moment out in the street. It was cold. <laughs> so uh, the Women's Art Library, is, uh, it, it's, it's based in special collections of Goldsmiths. It was gifted to Goldsmiths. So it wasn't something that was produced or bought by uh, you know, the institution, or uh, it wasn't ever a sort of academic project as such. It really was uh, an art project that was uh, started up by uh, a group of uh, women artists back in the late 70s. At the moment, it, uh, it, uh, it acts as, well, obviously it's a collection that people can consult and it has books and you know, all, you know this sort of research material that uh, gets researchers going. But it's also a, a, a project that kind of invites uh, different kinds of activities into the special collection space, um, even though, uh, for example, this particular presentation, the sort of evening of sharing, uh, of knowledge sharing with one of the uh, PhD candidates uh, in the art department, uh, you know, where we have a no food uh, uh, policy in that uh, room. But of course, uh, when it comes to feminist methodologies, you can't uh, sort of bring a lot of people in after hours uh, of an evening and not provide food. So I just love this picture where uh, the the massive buffet is kind of defying the the institutional definition of that space, and that's something that we like to do a lot. Um, this is behind the uh, staff only doors, and this is what the stack uh, looks like, the climate controlled stack. And what you see there, uh, sort of uh, poking out of the hanging files, is uh, uh, just uh, one sort of little drawer of. Uh, hanging files that collect, that uh, hold slides. So the Women Art, Women's Art Slide Library was a, a, a project that virtually uh, sort of crowdsourced uh, from women who self-identified as artists. So this material isn't something that was determined to be uh, 
representing the mainstream, particularly. In fact, it was representing people, uh, you know, artists who most of the time felt uh, marginalized or or invisible. And uh, the um, slide uh, library was constituted as an educational charity. Uh, but it all operated really as an in, as a kind of information activist project, and it was enhanced by producing these kind of the you know, by by producing publications. And so the newsletter that was uh, originally uh, about building community and was uh, uh, distributed to uh, amongst the membership of the Women Artists Slide Library, who were the women who submitted slides, uh, were uh, the publication developed into. Uh, something that engaged with the mainstream and uh, uh, in terms of the wider, uh, a wider global audience. So there was a kind of movement with the public uh, publication that sort of drew away from those early days of sort of uh, the women artists becoming more visible to each other and becoming a sort of cohering as a community to uh, a publication that was sort of taking on the art world and uh, becoming a very sort of different uh, kind of voice for the organization. But the core of the uh, this idea of, of uh, a politics of visuality was the, the slide. Now the slide was uh, what I call the JPEG of its time. It was uh, the, what I'm talking about are 35 millimeter uh, color transparencies. And these things were the things that uh, you documented your artwork with. It was the uh, image uh, format that you would teach with, and they were also often used, uh, usually usually larger transparencies, for uh, reproduction for print print media as well. But the, this was the currency of the time. And when an artist uh, produced the slide, she was uh, producing uh, reproducing, well, affirming herself as a as as an artist, and and, and or. Uh, affirming that particular the thing that she's bringing making a picture of as an artwork that will represent her art practice. Now, the nightmare of slides is that they that, that you can get an awful lot of them, and there are uh, uh, you know, over forty six, you know, nearly forty five thousand slides that were sort of, that came directly from artists that have you know been. Uh, uh, preserved by the Women's Art Library. Um, and what I've got, uh, what I, 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 my own personal research, I did a doctoral uh, 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 PhD uh, a couple of years ago, was to really um, ask how, how, you pre how you preserve the, the activist identity of a photographic collection like a, the, this slide collection. Uh, because this wasn't the only identity-based uh, uh, slide or, or, or uh, archive that was sort of coming out of the late 70s and early 80s, as I think Sunil will definitely uh, sort of talk about. Um, so, uh, and, you know, and in, in term, and the fact that there are so many slides is a kind of aspect of the, of the success of the project. But uh, how to make that this materials become redundant now? Um, and uh, the answer is uh, really not to digitize the slides. You know, you, you know, it's you know, how do I bring a visibility to these artists when I've never even seen the slides myself? There are, there really is such a density of material there. There's no way anybody has sort of actually cast their eyes on it. So what I did with my research to, to. Uh, was to take what I called slide walks. I would take a big chunk of, uh, uh, of these slide files. I would sort of set them out on a light box and I would just quickly photograph them. I was photographing them, including the mount. And it was a way of kind of seeing them through a digital uh, reproduction, through digitally photographing them. Um, and uh, I did this because I did, I, I, upstairs uh, in, at Goldsmiths Library, there was a uh, there was a room dedicated to the teaching slide collection. Once upon a time, this is we're talking around two thousand four, five, six, seven. Uh, that that had become redundant the the, the minute Kodak slide uh, carousels stopped being uh, sort of manufactured. So uh, the, there was the slide uh, collection being dismantled, and here I was with a with a slide collection that I knew 
didn't have duplicate uh, uh, images out in the digital world. That was very precious. And so I had to sort of think about how to how to think about the, the, the nature of the slide's visible identities and the, how the artist's identity is sort of uh, cohered with that, um, with this slide, as well as the artwork's identity. So there's a lot of uh, material in this, uh, this object that, that uh, what I feel actually resists um, digitization. So I take these slide walks and I, I, I identify the uh, slides as a kind of timing thing because I'm moving through. It's all about uh, uh, a different uh, perception, loosening up uh, my perception of this slide collection. And so these are images from a tiny section of slide walking through the artist whose last name is Lucas. And these are you know, my, my research photos. And then this is what they would look like digitized because when you do a standard digitized process, uh, you, that you prioritize the image. You think of the slide as just a sort of, uh, you know, that JPEG. Um, and I was, you know, uh, and, and what I felt was that uh, what happens here and you can see, you know, where is the artist in this? Of course, I've stripped out the metadata, but the, but the presence of the artist is also erased. And uh, I felt that it was effectively depoliticizing the slide collection itself, because with, with the erasure of the artist's, you know, evidence of the artist's labor, you don't get the sense of what the artist gave when she submitted slide, uh, her slides. I remember uh, uh, Shaheen Raleigh talking about um, uh, submitting slides to, to organizations all the time. And, and you know, he worked for uh, the Panchayat Archive. And he said it was like handing over your hard drive. I mean, this stuff was kind of precious. It's, it represents a lot. So this is an example of how uh, a slide from uh, the uh, African Asian Visual Artists Archive, another identity-based uh, slide collection at the time that was uh, being worked up in, by uh, Eddie Chambers was uh, uh, now appears, has a kind of afterlife in digital space as part of the uh, visual artist data service uh, collections. And this is a, a, a image of a, a work by Perminda Carr. And this is a, a slide uh, next, you know, from the Women's Art Library. So for um, you know this. So for me, there is this, there is a sense of loss. Uh, there is something. There is a problem here, or there is a sort of troubling uh, in this in the way we digitize. So I've, I've been involved with various projects that have you know, had different approaches to how we digitize uh, the slides you know, for, uh, that uh, that aren't about mass digitization, which is sort of about cloning and really not about interpreting. Uh, uh, so this is an example of how you might digitize a folder. And so you have the images and you have various texts that are in with these images as part of a, of a, a artist's folder. Um, and, it, and, and you kind of replace the physical kind of uh, aspects of browsing and everything through hyperlinking and maybe creating a kind of uh, sort of slightly trendy design. You know, again, we're talking about aesthetics. But what uh, artists fed back in, uh, about this particular project uh, was that they, you could lose the, the integrity of their own files. Somehow they started becoming too hyperlinked and, the, and their own uh, sort of the coherence of their practice was lost. Uh, this is another, so another approach could be that you, uh, you, the, you have artists conversations, you know, the artist comes in and she does her own version of digitizing the slides. So uh, Anne Prinsky in this uh, example had uh, contacted artists because of slides that she'd see. And it was a way of bridging, you know, well, using the slides as a stepping stone out to, to reach out to the artist to update their slide file in this virtual kind of way. Um, and then there's a, there was this other project, uh, which was about developing a, an app that you could use on your iPhone, which involved the artist. Uh, there were uh, seven artists involved as, as this pilot uh, project. Uh, and the artist, uh, the, uh, the lead researcher, this uh, Dr. Anna Maria Herman, who, who designed the app, who designed the concept and the app, uh, would spend a lot of time with uh, the artists. 
uh, that we found through the slide uh, collection. And she would interview them and then produce this, this uh, sort of page of uh, material that was very distilled with the uh, co co in collaboration with the artist. So there's a bit of audio from interviews uh, talking to her. Uh, there's also, we asked the artist to describe her own work and those, the magic 10 words, you know, this whole idea of keywords, summing up your practice. Uh, but at least with this, this uh, sort of app, there's also uh, uh, something of an intimacy with the material because you could hold this thing in your hands. These are uh, images that I, I, of my iPad uh, with the uh, app sort of delivering the slide to me on the screen on my desk. So there's a, so it's an interesting um, way of thinking of how you distribute uh, the digital object. Um, but um, the, there is the, I mean, I, but my, but the, this is me talking about my research with a slide, a slide projection, a real slide with a real carousel sort of projecting on that uh, curtain that my hand is across. And then the, the image I made of that slide uh, as part of my research being projected through the LCD screen. And, um, and, I'm, and I'm sort of rethinking how you, you distribute these digital objects and maybe how do you, not online necessarily, but maybe for projection only, because this is what these slides were originally meant to be. They were not just projected, but performed. And so uh, I, I did this project at, and we, this is in the space at the, the new CCA at Goldsmiths, the Center for Contemporary Art. Uh, and I, uh, this was a pitch that, uh, it was celebrating uh, the Art Librarian Society. And it was, I've set up three uh, slide projectors uh, in there. Uh, there's a student project on a light box over in the corner. Um, people came and talked about how they used to teach with slides, what we miss about slides, but really the future is the data projector there, the sort of little white um, object on a stand. And uh, this again is Marcia Bennett, who we saw, who's, uh, who was appearing in the iPad there. Uh, because, uh, and yeah, the, the future is the data projector. So the, this, uh, slideshow that I'm showing on the data projector in the company of all these other slide carousels is the slideshow that was uh, produced by Lauren Craig's that we saw at the very beginning. Now this is a, a, a later iteration of projection that we did of this uh, slideshow. These are slides that are that she uh, uh, scanned and uh, cleaned up and uh, sort of recreated as a kind of uh, a digital uh, film and uh, this in, in this way this is a kind of this is a more where the artist is paying tribute to other artists through uh, their her, her selection of uh, artwork that she uh, chose to work with um, and so these are all uh, women from the uh, who are in that, the slide collection that who are represented in the women of color index so this and now I am projecting to you the image of uh, Marcia Bennett's uh, sort of work that was being highlighted on the wall just there. And this is actually a better picture because you are in that dark and you do have these luminous images uh, sort of coming at you. And now what you're getting on your screen is a different kind of projection altogether. And this is the work of Gurmindus Khan. So just to end, um, I'm moving out of that, that uh, black background with the white words that is really about projecting the words on architectural spaces to what Lauren uh, Craig extracted from the slide mounts into a publication. Um, so we've got the black print on the white page. So there's a kind of nice, a different kind of projection here. But also what she did is sort of, produce a, 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 an alternative syntax of the writing on these slide mounts here. And uh, this is a sort of, a, a, for me, a kind of different digital reconfiguring of, of those that archives, you know, retaining the identity of these 
uh, slides, but drawing something else out because this publication, you know, this this poetry appeared in a what was called a creative finding aid uh, produced by the research group X marks the spot of the Women of Color Index. Uh, so this this creative finding aid uh, it has an interview with Rita Keegan, who was the coordinator of the Women of Color Index, uh, but it also has uh, you know, uh, creative responses and other essays you know, reflecting on the archive as well. Um, you know, they reactivated the women's art, uh, Women of Color Index, uh, and this their work, their project uh, sort of spanned from 2014 to 2015. Um, and so we're back out on the street. This is an Adrian Piper uh, slide being projected onto what was the former site of the, uh, the Center for Caribbean Studies, uh, which had been uh, relocated you know, that year to Warmington Tower up on the third floor, you know, away from the street and away from community. So this was a kind of tribute to you know, another project that was about uh, community building. Um, so, uh, yeah, I better stop because I'm sure I'm going on too long. But this is about coming to see the 35 millimeter slide is something that's like an actionable uh, piece of information. Um, and that and, you know, any movement for social change and parity generates and which becomes a kind of identity affirming uh, you know, archive. So thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, that was that was a wonderful uh, encounter with so many glimpses and different specificities and experiences of space. Um, thank you. That it very provocative in many ways. Moving forwards to thinking about that space and our relation to space. So we will now move on to Sunil. If you are ready to do the screen share. Yeah, I am. Excellent. So, uh, should we just go for it then? Yep. Okay. Here we go. Uh -huh. Right. So, I really want to just make, discuss this one project and what happened to it. Uh, I made this project in 1980 as a second year student at Farnham and uh, basically I was trying to use this newish medium for me tape slide so you have projected 35 millimeter slides which by the way were at the time and maybe even now the, gave you the best quality image enlarged on a wall uh, and uh, there were several aspects of making this project. It was a learning experience. It was part of my training. I was interested in finding out about gay life in London. I happened across this voluntary group, Gay Switchboard, which was started in 1974 and still goes to this day. So it was one of the largest, or I think the largest uh, gay organization at the time. And I was also learning how to uh, process film and a lot of this was handmade. And I came to them and I said, look, I want to do this to document what you do. And so they gave me access. And so I'll just show you what some of the pictures were like. And, oh, here we go. So I began by just documenting the space. It was a very modest space on Caledonian Road uh, above Houseman's Bookstore. And uh, there was uh, issue-based uh, information like this. The, this is the film Cruising that was uh, very controversial in its time. And of course, I was a little uh, anxious that my story was only had one picture in it which was somebody on the phone, because that's basically what they did was uh, answer the telephone. It was a set of telephone lines. And so uh, I decided I was going to enlarge my visual scope by 
uh, going to various venues that they were recommending. Uh, a large proportion of their calls in those days uh, was about newcomers coming into London and wanting to know where to go. Uh, so there were these kind of pubs and clubs and heaven had opened as a big disco. Uh, so it was very exciting for me as a young gay man to also go to these places and to experiment with 35 millimeter film, to process the film myself, to push it and to just play with the colors and all of that and to kind of document things. Uh, and I was just doing this with the aim of making a, a kind of documentary slide kind of project about them. But on the other hand, because I was in an art school at the time when theory was really coming in, I decided to undercut my documentary with a with certain kind of language of theory and to bring in text panels and to mix up. I had audio uh, from the project where people were speaking and then I mixed it all up. I mixed the men across the women and I had these kind of texts and interspersed with the pictures. And there were certain very specific moments, so sort of documented with an ex exact date. And this was happening at this time in this place kind of pictures. And these were the kind of people I was quoting in the text that were coming up. And uh, the consequence of all of this was that uh, when I first showed it to the volunteers to get kind of their approval, uh, half of them really disliked it intensely. So I didn't get approval, unfortunately. And so this project never saw the light of day. It was never shown again. And the only public presentation of anything from it was this picture that they used on their report the following year. And ever since then, it just lay, it kind of just gathered dust uh, amongst my various other debris. So I'm going to fast forward several decades later. Uh, a lot has happened since then. Uh, way too many pictures got taken. I've just turned into a shooter, which was, so I've just accumulated a vast amount of pictures. Uh, and I've been traveling and incredibly, and I've moved a lot because my circumstances have never been very stable. I mean, one of the things I think about archives is that they need a stable home. I've been unable to provide my own archives a very stable home base. So it's, they have moved around and lived in many situations and conditions. Uh, just now in the last few years, I found myself in a place where I'm able to afford to actually get it all out, but it's all in one place. I, I couldn't afford a, a space big enough for me and the archive to live in one place stored in different places. So it's finally all together in one place. Uh, I was interested in what Althea was saying about having the physical all around you, like being in those. This is my version of being in your uh, aisles, looking at all of the slides around you. And so mine are stored in these hangers. And that's basically what you're looking at. So just, we just, you just showed us some. So I have this vast collection of slides. This is actually not from Gay Switchboard, but it's it's a kind of gay history that I kind of collect all this material as I go along. It's not just pictures I take, but it's pictures I find, newspaper stuff that's happening around me at the time. But uh, a few years ago, uh, I got an interest in this particular project from a couple of curators who were putting on a show uh, based on the on that book Keywords uh, by Raymond Williams. And it took place, it was a collaboration between Innova in London and Tate Liverpool. And one of them had been over and he'd seen some of the slides in that, you know, in that, what I just showed you way. Uh, it was very haphazard. I couldn't bring all the, I didn't know how to bring all of the relevant pictures back together. Uh, it was, it was a tape slide, so the governing, the technical means were an eight track tape recorder. I didn't have one. I didn't know anybody else who had one. Uh, I had no way to kind of play it. And I didn't know how to reconstitute the picture. I don't know if I 
could find all the pictures. So uh, the curators uh, were very good with me. They said, okay, uh, we'll give up the idea of reconstituting the original tape slide because they were first very interested in the idea of that particular medium for the short-lived history, I understand. And that why don't I do a digital modern update of something? So uh, I scanned some of what I had. So this is now the scanned version. This is in Lightroom. And I made a, basically a video, a digital video to mimic the slides as they transition one into the other, uh, just to a soundtrack. Uh, and it was much shorter, like it was about five minutes. Uh, and so that is what was shown. Uh, at, and this, this was uh, exhibition at, at Liverpool. So basically that image at the bottom, which had long been forgotten, uh, suddenly got a lot of exposure. Uh, and that those set of pictures have seemed to have entered, uh, and this is now, where are we, 2014, made in 1980. So like, what's that about uh, uh, 34 years later or something? Uh, and so I'm beginning to appreciate that in my archives, there's a number of things that are worth considering that I shouldn't just spend every day going out to make yet more pictures and I should sit and think about what's here. And then, but never having the means to do it and all the rest of it. Uh, I have found though that uh, uh, I can't deal with it in the plastic sheets. There are too many and they're not all properly sorted out. Uh, and I just don't have the space to spread out too many of them. I can just do a few at a time and then I get very cramped. So I've been fortunate. My part-time teaching has encouraged students to come back to me as interns and slowly we scan bits of it. And work has, that's my time I'm saying, I have, <laughs> that my 10 minutes are up. <laughs> so, so, uh, Slowly, what I'm trying to persuade to say is that new contemporary projects are emerging from this 40 years of archives. Uh, and this was one of them. I just wanted to show you how this one came, was kind of uh, revitalized uh, from complete obscurity and suddenly it's at the Tate Liverpool. Uh, and yeah, so uh, there of course many more things to say, but we'll see how the discussion goes. But archives has sort of become core to what I'm doing these days. I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sunil. That was that was absolutely fabulous. It was really rich and engaging, and takes us in in circles and directions and back and forth with the with the other presentations in a in a very um in a very lively way with these gaps. So I'm gonna kick off with a question, which uh, I'm actually, I actually would like to kick off with a question for you. Um, so now of course I have questions for everybody and uh, I think we can speak amongst ourselves, but I wonder, I, I, I wondered how, when you were taking the photos initially in 1980, whether you had to explain to people what you were doing when you were, you know, in uh, going into a club or something like this, when you were taking it, did people ask you, or did you say, "I'm I'm an art student and I'm making a project around"? What, what did you? What, how did you break that that kind of potential confrontation, potential hostility, which I'm sure must have been present sometimes? Yeah. Well, first, what I would do is get the permission of the management. Yeah. So the people in charge of the venue would be aware that I was there taking pictures. But then once I was in, uh, I was uh, honing my trade as a photojournalist to be kind of surreptitious. And I wasn't using a flash. I was pushing the film as far as I could, you know, uh, and uh, making, you know, two second exposures 
using a friend's shoulder as a tripod, trying not to be too obvious. Yeah. And it was dark, you know? Yeah. So people really didn't see me. So I guess I was kind of sneaking around a little bit that way. Yeah. 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 So you were you were being quite subversive. I, in, in I wasn't. The, yeah, yeah. I wasn't yeah. going up to people and getting. There are no model releases or signed anything about no, no, what I was no, no. doing. Okay. Yeah. So you were. Yeah. You were. You were. You were a bit of an interloper taking the shots. I uh, was. The management's awareness of. of yeah. What but you then were. I felt very justified because I was doing it for. the the cause that for the yeah. greater good yeah. of documenting the work of gay switchboard, which seemed very worth worthwhile. Yeah. And I didn't think it would go any further than that, you see. I had no plan to sell it commercially or make you know money in some way out of these pictures. And was were, did the when you showed the material that you had to the gay switchboard people, yeah. uh, and they didn't like it or some of them didn't like it, was it the was it the sort of sense of data protection that they were anxious about or? No, you, no, no. There were, uh, I think a lot of people, people were expecting me to present a standard documentary feel good version of what a yeah. voluntary group might be doing, you know, like a funder might commission. And they were very shocked at what I had done uh, which was to intermingle what they do mm. with uh, what I thought was very cutting edge uh, photo art theory and images. Because I didn't just have quotes from Sontag, etc. I also had pictures from Robert Mapplethorpe, mm. and I had the hardcore ones. Mm. So while we're talking about caring for people and answering the phone and suicide calls and sending people to heaven there'd suddenly be a picture of a very hard black penis by Robert Mapplethorpe. And I just, I didn't think that they would react badly to it. I don't know what, I mean, I was probably very green as well. I just, I was learning all this and mm. simultaneously uh, at college, you see, and we were debating all of this and I just was putting it, because it was all really meant for my degree also. Mm. I had to make it like a critical piece of work. It couldn't be just a straight, you know, documentary. And, uh, but then I showed it to people who weren't used to this idea at all, that the voice doesn't match the picture of the speaker, that a woman is speaking and then suddenly her voice disappears and a man is speaking over and she's apparently still talking. They didn't, that really didn't go down well. Uh, that kind of playing with the medium in that way, breaking it up in all possible ways. Yeah, no, that's, 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 thank you very much. I mean, that sort of, it, it that answers the, what, I, where I'm, what I'm thinking, how I'm thinking and, and sort of pushes it really into this question of context, which is obviously, you know, pressing for all of us and the, the, the context of, of the material, the context of how we address that material. Uh, and also the context of where it's situated. So for who yeah. it's situated? I mean, this is a problem we had uh, throughout the 80s with the left in London, which is that visually people were not progressive at all. People wanted really traditional materials. So if you messed around, you know, if the art was too radical, they wouldn't accept it. Uh, our, our audience, you know, the people you thought you were working for mm. primarily. Yeah, no, thank that you. That was a problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that that, that uh, circumstance is applicable really to all, to both um, Althea, Duncan, to all of us, this question of the kind of the material itself and its, its sense of horizontality and the, 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 or should we say the linearity, but I don't mean sequential linearity. I mean, um, the, I mean, how we access the sort of layers of data and what that data is, and then how we create the structure of those layers. And I, I wonder, I mean, the, there's, a, there's a very interesting, there's a very specific resonance because of the time, the time that each of you are speaking at, um, you know, the, the 70s, 80s, there's a big kind of, uh, I mean, there's a synchronicity here. With what with what we're with what we're addressing, um, and and I, I wonder if I could if I could ask you, um, Althea. But please 
we can I can step back and we can ask each other. It's just it's quite a, a sort of formal situation because of the, the you know the thing on the thing off and if your speaker thing is on and off and so on. Um, but I wonder if I could ask you about um, the the relationship between the space of encounter in the slides and what you were doing, and then the digitalizing project that uh, that you showed us um, that uh, that that has been that has been done, and that kind of space, that kind of I think you you've called it um, a, a post feminist digital space. <laughs> and I wonder if you could if you could sort of move us in that direction a bit of of that very uh, horizontal methodology of inclusiveness with, in this space. Um, Could I ask I, you to say something around that? Okay. Actually, I think it, what it was was I, uh, I described my thesis as taking us into a post-digital. Mm. Was it post-feminist? I don't think it was. I don't think that we have a post-feminist yet. So. Mm. Um, but it was, uh, but, uh, uh, but a feminist space for sure. And I think that is me trying to, um, again, kind of read this, this slide collection as researchers read it actually, um, when they're aware of it as, 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 as a quintessentially feminist project. There aren't enough slide collections that we can view, to be honest, you know, like Sunil's or even you know the African Asian Visual Arts Archive slide collection. There's plenty of evidence of, of the slides you know, online because they have been digitized you know in that way that I I showed with the uh, Visual Arts Data Service, um, which is a way of preserving those images because the Visual Arts Data Service uh, uh, up, uh, uh, keeps up with the technology sort of updates the technology in order to keep these images sort of accessible but in terms of what the slide collection still does it 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 takes up space which was the part of this this project of visibility was to actually create a public space for women to see themselves to be able to come and borrow slides and take them out to, to uh, teach with to introduce women's art practice to whatever spaces they were actually earning money in because nobody could make a living as an artist everybody moonlighted and did different jobs and it, it and so this idea of uh the space being turned over to other people which is what i'm constantly trying to do at goldsmith which is why i like a load of bananas on a light table which is what you saw is is uh, really part of me um, hanging on to the original mission of the of the you know the reason why you would set up a slide library in the first place, which would be to uh, uh, create a space uh, somewhere um, for people who are feel disenfranchised from institutions to see themselves and to um, I guess to. Uh, so that one of the things that uh, I, I've heard that people who are involved with the X Marks the Spot Artistic Research Group, which includes the uh, activist arch archivist uh, Ego Ahiwe Sawinski, who also worked with the Joe Spence archives, and that's sort of how they came through to uh, the Women's Art Library and then uh, the Women of Color Index is how important it was to be given that space to work and explore and for not not to have some kind of academic uh, research outcome or something to 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 be the condition under which they were there you know um anyway yeah i don't know if that's answering your question no, at no, no, no thank you thank you very much i think that i mean that that leads me on to, to my next question, which actually I would like to address to Duncan, although uh, it's it's of course relevant for everybody. But um, um, where are we, I think the the thing the pressing one of the pressing things is where are we our voice the voice us as representing another representing multiple voices where is that voice and how do you how do you find that. Um, Duncan, in relation to the to your interrogation of the material, and I mean, with the Bernadette 
with the Bernadette um, film, uh, did you feel as if you had a responsibility to Bernadette or was it that you actually wanted her, her material to be situated now with, or when you made it in the in the public domain in order for those for, for its audience to experience the pressingness of what she was doing? You need to unmute your your uh, your. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Um, so can I just ask you back uh, when you say we, do you mean uh, we as like artists, we as an audience? We we as the person who's 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 handling the material. Right. The royal we. Yeah, <laughs> the royal we. Um, the one who the one no the one who's making that thing, you know. So like you know, or each each of us in different ways is dealing with material, and so. How, the the decision making processes of how we are in relation to that material we you know are conditioned obviously by the circumstances and obligations and i wondered how you, i mean you spoke e each of you although sunil doesn't directly say it each of you has spoken directly or indirectly about glimpses and alluded to gaps so i wondered if you could say a little more about you in those gaps and mm. where you are in re in your relation to Bernadette in this instance? I mean, I suppose the first thing to say is like, I do feel like a basic kind of identification with her and, you know, mm. what, what she was trying to do, what she is trying to do. Um, so I think that's the kind of fundamental basis of of um you know wanting to make a film about it but then you know as as i was saying when i was talking that you know when you when you actually um you see the the uh, material that you have available to to put the whole thing together and um like how heavily mediated that already is and all the kind of frames of references that are kind of embedded within that i mean so it seems kind of it doesn't seem viable to me to kind of gloss over that so i mean i think but but that's not to say that you know like what i've ended up doing is just like it's just kind of using her as an example to say that you know meaning is impossible under those circumstances. I think I am a bit kind of trying to have my cake and eat it to, um, to, to, to do a bit of both, you know, yeah. but also I think, uh, I mean, I think um, the, it, I, for me, it kind of seems like part of a process and that's sort of, I mean, it, it's not something that I foresaw at the, at the outset of the, of the project but for example um there was a woman called Lilia Doolan um who is a, is a very good friend of uh Bernadette McCallisky's um who contacted me after and I was kind of involved in a film that she'd made about that because she was you know she'd been doing it working on it for about 10 years and you know on on a bit of a shoestring sometimes mm. Um, the thing about the moving image archives is that they are, it is a really kind of expensive uh, habit, you know, so, so even to access the material in the first, in the first case, um, it requires quite a bit of money, you know, even to get the, the time coded screeners. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is kind of prohibitive in its own, in its yeah. own way. Yeah, 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 so, absolutely. It's, yeah, it sort of d determines what you can, how much you can access, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm think... mindful of, there are some some questions coming in, which I, I we could carry on amongst ourselves, but I think let's open up to, to the audience. I have, I have a few questions and I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, to the, give this one, please answer any of you or all of you. Um, there's one question coming in, which is uh, uh, someone whose whose work is concerned with the role of memory in the construction of identity, and to what extent is the utilization 
of material, archival material, and the, the properties, the aesthetic properties of that passing um, as a way of representing for the sake of a collective memory, but also as a sort of that collective memory, but also to what extent is finding something that's been locked away, you know, maybe in a drawer or maybe a half remembered thing, which is then resituated, give, give a new meaning for a new audience. So the conjoining, could I ask, could I throw that open to, to you? Who would like to, to take that? I'm going to listen a, to Sunil first. <laughs> okay, I'm going to attempt a very brief, limited response. Uh, having been a migrant several times over, I feel like uh, you reinvent yourself and then you come across this, this object or artifact or image from your past uh, much later, in maybe another place even, and uh, it sort of lies there without too much meaning. And then something outside your control seems to trigger uh, a moment that enables you to act on it. So I feel like I'm not in control of that external force that creates the opportunity. It's a bit like how case switchboard happened the second time around. I had no idea that was gonna happen. I couldn't have made that happen. It took something from the outside uh, to make my memory come, become relevant again. So I think that's my contribution to this. I, this. Um, when, you were, when you were reading out the question, it made me think of the instances where artists come and revisit their slide files and they'll say, oh, I forgot about that work. I mean, people, don't keep up, I mean, it's not about keeping up with yourself, but there, there is in the material a way of reconnecting with your own practice as well. So, and also initially how um, the difference between the women's art slide library and maybe more professional, different kinds of slide collections that were all about staying updated. You never had the old work in there. You never had the embarrassing old work in there. Mm -hmm. So that the, the, but when uh, artists would come to ask, can you clear out the old, can, send me the old stuff. And I would always ask them, actually, there's a different way of looking at all this series of, of, of slides at, you know, in terms of what it means to researchers or, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of younger women art students or who or practitioners who uh, want to be able to see uh, trajectories and uh, in some ways not reinvent that wheel as well, uh, mistake or whatever. Yeah, so mm -hmm. there, it, uh, but also the trouble with a, a understanding archives as a collective memory is that it's not always the content that is what you should be looking at. It should be the shape of it or in, in, in a way how Lauren uh, extracted the slide mounts and sort of turned it into slide mount texts and became, it became a kind of poetic uh, sort of statement, how you look across the, the archive in a different way. So it's not always about uh, reading each object, but understanding, you know, it's collect, uh, a collective kind of, presence and that is achieved through the physicality of it too so that's going back to this idea of a post-digital feminist post-digital kind of way of you know that this project is that's kind of what I was aiming at you know it invites a different kind of method of approach uh, to information I guess mm. yes I, I, this, this sort of leads to an, another question. Um, I think we have time for two more. This, this one is um, following nicely in that sort of train of thought. Um, the sort of relationship really between fictional archives and real archives. To what extent are the fictional archives an alternative to the real archive when getting access to archives can be expensive? 
or difficult? And what is the potential of fiction in archival art? <laughs> I think I think that what is the potential of fiction in archival art is a is a, a rather um, lovely way to uh, consider what material it what the material is what what do we mean by a fiction. Mm. I mean, I think that's the for me that's that's a kind of um, it is a really interesting question because it it does seem that um, you know like advertently or inadvertently fiction or fictional kind of conventions are, are already kind of embedded in a lot of this stuff. So, you know, I mean, you know, if you just take like, uh, I mean, documentary film, for example, like the, the structure of it is kind of, um, uh, it does kind of use a lot of like the build up of tension and, you know, building towards some kind of conclusion. Um, so all of that, all of that sort of stuff is in the form anyway. Um, I was just thinking, just in relation to the um, to the first question as well, um, about um, uh, about that question of of collective memory, um, and you know, in terms of form, but like how, there is almost an archive of that. And when you re-encounter that, I was thinking actually a lot about when I first saw like a lot of the early Channel 4, um, like the stuff that they commissioned as a station. So there was no kind of um, requirement to, to earn advertisement revenue. So they commissioned all this pretty amazing stuff and it is a real kind of shock and revelation, actually, looking back on that now, because I think that's the thing that does kind of accrue over time, that you, you become used to certain kind of formal conventions and take them for granted. But then, you know, when you see something from the past, it does really kind of um, jars with that or kind of displaces it in a way. Mm. It creates a sort of strange sort of juxtaposition because there's that, that common what one might describe as a sort of common or shared uh, understanding of a particular moment and a particular sequence. And it, it becomes embedded in the narratives of our individual memories. But then encountering it in a, in a, in a new context br brings our individual circumstances and memories into relation with this sort of collective shared excitement or uh, or curiosity or whatever that particular experience was in relation to with the channel four materials and the and the the dyna dynamism of that or we could have a particular sort of set of of uh, investigative film and pe and people remember oh yes that was a very pertinent moment and it, it and of a certain generation you'll have layers of people who do remember and then rendering that now into a accessible form is brings into question all sorts of different um, considerations in relation to, to this question of the the collective and the personal and and the situatedness of it. Um, and I wonder I wonder how we grapple with this individually this this difficulty and it this kind of ties in with. Um, a, a question here that is focused around um, the individual's experience. It, it's actually addressed to Sunil, um, and it, it's the, the relationship between being in a club when you're in a club with a camera and without a camera, what were the differences of that? Um, and But also, especially how you remember those recollections of being with the camera and being not with the camera but I think the, the sort of fundamental um, question here is how does the documentation of those moments change the memory which is obviously applicable to each each of you each of us how does the documentation of it change our memory of it individually well I in direct response to the question and, and the club pictures is yeah. that uh, the very nature of the medium and the long exposures that were necessary 
I was getting an image that you didn't see with the naked eye. So actually my pictures are all fiction because you don't see it like that. Because they're, uh, uh, so sometimes I would try to use the light of the, you know, of the strobe lights over the dance floor, which, which, which are like flashlights. And that's not how you experience it at all when you're there live. So there was that aspect to it. So the technology is sort of lying a bit. And then, yes, and I do subsequently in retrospect, remember the picture rather than the lived experience. The pictures replaced my lived experience uh, often. Uh, but I think uh, what I wanted to also say about the other earlier question uh, before that about the fiction uh, aspect of archives is that uh, after Gay Switchboard, I realized that documentary was not an option for me in this area I was investigating around queer lives, both in London and in India. Uh, fiction would have to be the answer. So I was kind of reconstructing a present that was a fiction to represent itself. You see what I mean? So, uh, and people subsequently audiences have told me that uh, they read them as fact. And when I've disillusioned them about some of these pictures, they uh, they felt a bit cheated because I think uh, they wanted to, they, they want to see them as fact. That's one area. What the, and then the other area uh, is actually uh, our collective past as gay men. It's often not recorded. So what do you do with, say, the 19th century? You knew people were around, you knew lives were late, but there is no, there's no visual archive. So uh, some people I know are in the business of recreating those now as as fictional archival, you know, based around actual histories of people and events and wars and such like yeah th thank you very much i think i think we should we should start to wind up but um i would just like to to give to give one question to wind up which is the the question and concern about authenticity to go back to the notion of authenticity and what authenticity means in relation to the analog type of interface I think this is a good, good question to to lead to our closure. I don't know. If, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not very academic, but this makes me think of of the Siegelub book that you opened up with, Joe, and how uh, the seeing seeing images, seeing the typescript. And it's all moving, so you don't really, you can't really see, can't study it. But there were also uh, images of documents where you saw the edges, which again becomes the research photo rather than the thing that you may want to represent the document by or something like that. And this, and there is something reassuring about being able to see when we scan, you know, uh, uh, documents in in special collections, we try to keep the edges because it, 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 that adds to the authenticity, I suppose, of, of how that, uh, yeah, what that document is. But authenticity is really about the whole uh, context and how you can reassure yourself of where it's sitting now and provenance and all sorts of, you know, other things. Um, and uh, yeah, the digital is a, is a slippery, is a slippery process that's that is that aims at authenticity but will always distort it so even a digital surrogate of a document that you could study down to the grain of the paper is is not you know like sunil's experience in the nightclub is not how you would experience it if you're mm. sitting there under. it's the slippery it's the sort of slipperiness and it kind of leads me to to um uh, a word a couple of words to look to you know, to sort of summarize, it's the slipperiness that in a way that we can say that takes us back to that, that, that space of 
of the of the gap between what's being experienced, what is being recollected through the experience, that kind of juxtaposition of things. Of, I mean, Sunil speaking about about the strobe lights. You know, there's also the smells, and there's the whole kind of you know the the peripheral noise that you can't actually really hear, but you hear as well as here. So it's a sort of pre all this pressing, layering of the immersive experience and exposure and the slipperiness of attempting to represent or to capture, you know, and then to, to be authentic about that capturing. There's always a gap, there's always a, a lack, there's always a fiction. And um, I think that, that I, for, I would like to end by thanking you all for absolutely fascinating presentations. And we could go on, but I'm, I know that, they're, that this thing finishes like suddenly, like a, a very ab abrupt and, uh, uh, and brutal fashion. So it remains for me to say thank you all very much for, for speaking today, for giving us a fa fascinating insight into your practices and for discussing these ideas in a very open forum here. And I'd, I'd like to thank the South London Gallery and the New Contemporaries, and I'd like to hand over to Kirsty, who will say goodbye before we get boomed off. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Joe, for sharing. Thank you, Althea, Duncan, and Sunil for your incredible contributions and insights. And thank you all very much uh, for joining us this evening and do uh, keep following us uh, on all of our various channels. So thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.